today we'll be moving really into the third unit of our course, which is understanding the qualitative and semi-quantitative implications of our theory. Now our theory is based on this de Broglie hypothesis that we had described last time, and it's really a generalized form of what de Broglie proposed, but it contains really uh, all of the essence of, of what he had suggested. Uh, but we've just tied it in a particular way to the experiments that we've been reviewing. So the basic hypothesis, you recall, has five key elements. And the hypothesis is that detections of nature's building blocks, electrons, nuclei, or even photons, and it's very important to realize there's something remarkable going on here because all of these building blocks, even our interaction, all obey these key properties. And that is that the detection of these building blocks always occurs as a discrete event happening at a random location X with a prob, but it's not chaos. There's a well-defined probability that these random locations follow, and that probability is computable as the square amplitude of superpositions of waves, standard superpositions of waves with square amplitude to give us brightness, but those waves have to have a particular wavelength and frequency so that we can compute the superposition. And the particular wavelength is h over p, and the particular frequency is given by h nu equals the Hamiltonian, which is just the energy of the particle written in terms of its momentum. Now, it's very important for us to understand the evidence of, for this hypothesis because this is where we've synthesized then all of our new experimental evidence. And then from this, we are uh, going to then develop our theory. Right now, we will explore the uh, semi uh, qual in a qualitative and semi-quantitative way the implications of this de Broglie hypothesis. In the next unit in the course, we will get very formal and precise and mathematical. But this hypothesis then really represents the cent intellectual center point of this course. It's been building up from all kinds of experimental evidence to this hypothesis, and now we will be exploring its implications. So let's see what really is the evidence for all of this. And it's really uh, uh, striking how clear the evidence is, even for di very different particles. Now, as I've mentioned previously, uh, the experiments for nuclei are very give very similar results to the, uh, the results of very similar results to those of the electrons. So uh, really, we're just kind of folding the nuclei in with the electrons. But we have separate experiments uh, for the photons as well. So here's the evidence. I'll list evidence for the five given facts for photons first. And then second, I will describe what it is for electrons. And the, um, set, there are very similar experiments for the nuclei as well. So the first thing is that these detections happen as discrete events. Now. The discreteness of the photons, that was uh, G.I. Taylor's, I mean, that's the photoelectric effect, right? Where uh, we see the individual photons knocking electrons out of the cathode. The uh, discreteness for the electrons is very nicely shown in Millikan's oil drop experiment. So that's the discreteness. Now these detections, though, do happen at random locations that occur with certain probabilities. And the evidence for that fact, that they are random, but yet guided by a probability, comes very clearly for the photons from the G.I. Taylor experiment, and also from the corresponding G.P. Thompson experiment for the electrons. Remember here, we saw very beautiful diffraction patterns emerging. But the statistics show, and you can do these with very dim sources, that even when the particles go in one at a time, they somehow spookily build up these very coherent uh, overall patterns. And the only way that can happen, because the particles the um, experiments show are behaving statistically independently, is if, and so they can't know where the other ones have arrived, that means they must be arriving at random locations, but guided by particular probability distribution. Now, moreover, that distribution corresponds to the brightness for a standard uh, electromagnetic wave type uh, diffraction pattern. We see that, of course, trivially for the fact that they are electromagnetic waves when we look at uh, Taylor's experiment, but also in G.P. Thompson's experiment, we saw very beautifully the pattern the electrons build up is exactly the same as for light and x-rays. Now, once we know that it's uh, calculatable in the standard way by superposing waves, we then just need to know what are the wavelengths of the waves and what are their frequencies.
Now for the wavelengths for, um, and their relation to the momentum, for the photons, that evidence comes very clearly from Compton scattering, where the momentum we showed very clearly was h times frequency over the speed of light. But, as you rem may recall from your standard wave physics, c over nu is actually lambda, so we can rewrite this as momentum is h over lambda, and that is uh, mathematically equivalent to our statement number four. So that's the photon evidence. For the electron evidence, that's where we first really thought about this equation. That was the Davis and Germer experiment, where we could very beautifully uh, change the voltage to uh, send down electrons with different momenta onto a surface, and then observe then how they would scatter at certain preferred angles in interference fringes from which we could directly determine the corresponding wavelength and how it depended upon the incoming momentum. And then finally, our evidence for the last statement that gives us the frequency for photons, that came directly from the photoelectric effect, where we had concluded E equals H nu, where we first saw Planck's constant. And of course, if you want, we can rewrite that energy, uh, formally speaking, as a Hamiltonian, which is always equal to the energy, but written in terms of the momentum of the particle. Either way you slice it, the energy of the photon was H nu very clearly in the photoelectric experiment. For the electrons and for the nuclei also, uh, the argument was a little more subtle. It came down to the correspondence principle because we know that in electric devices and cathode ray tubes, these particles actually follow classical trajectories. So we need to find a way where we can make superpositions of waves, which is what we feel is really going on, right? But to show that they can explain all the prior classical physics experimental evidence. And for that to happen, we need to be able to construct waves in such a way that their wave packets will track and correspond to uh, the predictions of classical physics. And in particular, we showed that the wave packets line very nicely up their movement with Hamilton's first equation if we make this choice that the frequency of the waves is given by the classical Hamiltonian we would associate with the particles. And I think we showed that quite clearly. So therefore, we have quite strong evidence for all of these assumptions, and that these assumptions actually work as a hypothesis not only for uh, the photons or the electrons separately, but actually for all of our known constituents. So our task now then is to begin to build up a uh, theoretical picture of what now the implications are that we can explore from our particular hypothesis.